Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, so we're going to get started with some quick introductions. I'm Aunt Chaudhary. I'm a product manager at Splunk, and I've been focusing on engaging closely with end users, helping them adopt open telemetry over the last three years or so. And I'm joined here by um, Anthony. Anthony Mirabella. I'm a senior SDE at Amazon. I've been working on open telemetry for about five years now, uh, including uh, our ADAT distribution for the last three, and also our managed service for Prometheus. Awesome. So what are exactly the next 20 to 25 minutes going to look like, right? So what we're going to be looking to do is really provide a, a use case driven view into what end users can really benefit from, right? From some of the processing capabilities that you can get from the open telemetry project. We're going to highlight some best practices on how you can actually control your data volume, optimize costs, so that you can actually focus on the data that really matters most to you. We'll also be calling out really some common real world scenarios, some pitfalls, some trade-offs, right? So that you, when you actually need to really question that in terms of your own production environment, you can really make the right decisions and move forward. So let's start off. Um, I think it's really important to set the stage in terms of why this is relevant today, right? Um, the conversation around cost and complexity, it's, it's, it's extremely complex. Uh, it really gets, starts off from really the base use case around that you've seen extreme acceleration in data growth, right? When it comes to modern IT environments, especially coming to Kubernetes, right? Where there are massive amounts of data that are being created on a minute to minute standpoint, right? So there are a lot of questions that come out from end users around storage, processing costs. What does billing look like? Um, what are my license costs? Right? So I think that really serves as the base for a lot of the discussions with end users today. Thereafter, in terms of the, num the, the amount of data that's coming in, users are often using multiple tools and agents, right? which often require really specialized knowledge and maintenance, and that's that, that really becomes very complicated to be able to handle in terms of telemetry. Beyond costs, right, which comes like from a monetary standpoint, it's really important to take and, and really pivot into what engineering costs look like, right? That's another way of looking at this as well. So there's always a learning curve that starts right from getting your data in, right? So uh, really focused on what are the tools that need to be used, right? Um, how, how do I really better filter or really look at metadata more appropriately? So I think that's a key piece that must be kept in mind, and that also comes into the picture when you're really migrating from one vendor to the other in terms of an observability solution. So in all of this, as you've heard a lot about Otel through the day as well, how does Otel really answer some of these concerns or challenges, right? So I'll be focusing on a couple. Again, you're no longer reliant on, on a single vendor. There's no specific siloed expertise as well that's expected. But with standardization, what really helps, not only from a monetary standpoint, but also operationally, is that it's, it's a lot easier in terms of troubleshooting and querying experiences, right? So the standards and the metadata that you're looking at in terms of the data model that has been set up, right, it makes it extremely easy to filter, to query the right information that really matters to you. And really focusing on what we're going to hone in on today, right, the fact that you have complete control and ownership. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of the processing capabilities that Otel provides today, and you'll, you'll really see more of that as we get into it more further. But you can really focus on really what matters most to you, right? And then again, when it comes to engineering costs and resources, you can really leverage the entire ecosystem that's contributing, right, in terms of new features, support as well, right? So that really reduces the toil in terms of development, right, which comes in from one organization to the other. So this is a good segue into the next, right, what, what pipelines are. So go ahead, Anthony. Sure. So uh, this is a, a picture from the Open Telemetry demo application that talks about uh, the pipelines that are set up in its collector. And we'll, we'll be using this kind of as the, the basis for our discussions today. Uh, and we can see here that uh, data comes in from the left and flows through to the right. And we'll be going through a number of steps where we uh, transform or enrich or change the type of, of data. We, we at some points, you know, move from traces to metrics. Um, and all of these happen uh, in 
processors or connectors in the open telemetry collector's parlance, um, which are components that can receive data from one signal type uh, and produce data of that same type to, a, uh, to the rest of the pipeline or to uh, another type of data in the form of a connector. Great, so again, coming back to really common questions, right? Common use cases and scenarios. You'll, you'll really not see many observability-related conversations without cost, without optimization, volume, what does billing look like, um, right? And, and that's what we're going to be focusing a lot on in terms of some of the best practices and the trade-offs associated with each of them. Right? So we'd really like to start off with a fairly basic use case. Again, you, uh, these are scenarios that you've come across extremely often, but I'd really like to take this across into a more of an end-user-driven use case, right? So what are some of the most common use cases and questions that come up in terms of filtering? So really thinking of filtering, again, just thinking of excluding your metrics traces logs, right, based on some predefined rules or, or conditions. Uh, starting off something very, very common, and I'm sure a lot of you face that in your infrastructure at scale today. When scraping Prometheus metrics, a very common challenge is just the overwhelming number of metrics that are being uh, really scraped and captured, right? The metrics generated by Envoy in your Istio service, service mesh, right, can really result in high cardinality metrics, right? So think of your service-to-service -service communication, things like request paths, your, um, your request IDs, as well as really your session IDs, for example, right? So that's where really customers and end users would really want to be pivoting to using a specific filtering component or a strategy which they can actually bring down the number of metrics that they're pulling in as well as reduce their cardinality in some way. Then again, you also want to question whether how much of value do, do really some of your spans related to your health check endpoints or let's say your admin related use cases, uh, static assets as well, do they really matter to you in terms of your troubleshooting experiences? So that's, again, another scenario where end users want to filter out spans related to these uh, use cases, moving on to maybe some services that are not critical, right, or environments, maybe some of the, like your development or staging environments where you can actually specifically look into the services that you want to filter out spans from, your metrics, your logs, that's something you can very easily be able to do as well from a processing standpoint. Right? And then we've heard of this through the day as well earlier, right, that it's important to understand the structure of your logs, to, un to understand how you're really logging, because uh, logging can get really verbose. Right? If you're looking at getting your debug level statements out, you can actually use the processing capabilities and components right, within the open telemetry collector to just exclude these detailed debug logs and just focus on the logs that really matter to you in your production environments. Right? So, Really, uh, as you look at all these specific use cases and, and as we really go into the others as well, we've really linked out to some of the components that you can use, right? Uh, we'll also go into some deep dives in configuration, but in this case, feel free to kind of take snapshots as well as point out to the filter processor, for example, something that you can use within the collector. You can use that based on the open telemetry transformation language. I think that's Great, where you can actually uh, use existing OTTL statements, which really call functions as well, right, based on OTTL grammar, right, which allows you to really make full advantage of these processing capabilities. So all this is great, right? So what's important to take a step back, though, is really ask yourself, is there anything that I should keep in mind, any trade-offs, any pitfalls? And I think some of the common things that we've come across has been Filtering has to be really well tested and scoped, right? So you want to make sure that you use as specific a configuration as possible, really to make, like ensure that you're not filtering out the telemetry that's really critical to you. So again, we've seen very common scenarios with regexes or other pattern matching use cases where filtering has often gone wrong with end users, right? So I think that's one thing to definitely keep in mind. But again, uh, does it really solve all scenarios, right? Where does filtering uh, kind of drop off and what would make sense to move on to the next strategy? I think that's a key scenario that we're going to really get into in a minute. This really comes into the picture when you really plug in the filter processor within your pipelines, right? And as Anthony pointed out, you can actually just plug that in within your metrics pipeline within the collector. 
So another way to, to process data that moves through a collector, uh, particularly if you're looking at reducing data without uh, getting rid of that useful information that you have is sampling. Um, and key to sampling is identifying what are representative traces um, so that you can keep some of your traces but not all of them. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can do sampling. Um, if you want to do head sampling, uh, which is shown over here on the left, uh, traditionally you're going to, in your SDK, decide based on um, either attributes of the request or some percentage of data, I want to sample this, this trace uh, and communicate that to all of the other things that participate in the trace. But you have to make that decision early on before you know if it's necessarily going to be interesting or representative. Alternately, you can use the collector to perform tail sampling wherein uh, you don't make that decision early, you defer it as long as possible, and you wait until after you've uh, aggregated all of the spans for a given trace into a collector instance, and then you can look at it and say, uh, was there an error in any of the spans on this trace, or were any of the spans on this trace slow? Um, and if they are, then I'm much more interested in them. And if not, then I'll just pick a random sample to have some representation of the boring, uninteresting, normal case traces. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if you're going to do tail sampling, though, is you do need to ensure that all of the spans for a given trace get to the same collector. Um, and so in this case, as it's, it's easy if you have a single collector instance, all of your spans for all of your traces are going to the same place anyways. Um, but if you start to grow your collector and scale it out horizontally, you'll have to look at a two-tiered architecture where you have a front-end layer of collectors that can act as a trace-aware load balancer and use the trace ID on incoming spans to route the, the data for that span to the appropriate backend collector, which will then run the tail sampling processor uh, and give you that information about um, just the interesting uh, traces. Uh, so here I've got an example of a configuration for a tail sampling processor that will do kind of what I just said earlier. It'll, it'll look for uh, traces that had an error in any of its spans uh, or it, it, any that were uh, longer than 500 milliseconds uh, or if none of those interesting conditions will happen, it'll take 10% of, uh, of spans. Um, and we can kind of see here uh, in a, a picture of the collector's self-telemetry for a collector running this configuration uh, where I move over here. Uh, at, at this point here, uh, we were running the span to metrics processor generating metrics off of, uh, or, sorry, the, we're running span metrics all the way through getting, getting metrics off of all of our spans. We added the, the tail sampling processor at this point and you can see the, the volume drop way off. Uh, unfortunately, it dropped off a little bit too much um, because uh, in order to make those decisions, the collector does need to keep all of the, the spans for a trace in memory. Uh, so one of the options that's in this configuration it controls how many uh, spans it will keep in memory. You need to make sure that based on how long you want to wait to make that decision, you keep a, a big enough pool of spans so that it can actually accurately make that decision. Otherwise, it's going to think nothing here is interesting because nothing has any useful uh, data. So once that was fixed, then we see here that the, the rate of outgoing traces or outgoing spans, incoming spans stayed at about 250 the whole way through, but outgoing we reduced to about 20% of that. Um, and those that are outgoing are going to be the ones that are interesting to us then at this point. They're gonna be the ones that have errors, the ones that are slow, um, and some small chunk of all of the others. Um, so that's, that's a huge reduction in volume outbound. Uh, and if you're paying per span or per trace that, that you're sending to your backend, that can be a huge cost savings. But there are some trade-offs, right? Um, if you've got enough volume that just a small percentage of your spans are interesting or, or would give you representative uh, interesting traces, maybe you don't need to bother with tail sampling. Um, that can make it a little easy. Uh, it's, it's really good if you've got some common criteria that make it easy to identify uh, what is an interesting span. Uh, in the prior config example I showed, uh, looking at the error status. That's great. Uh, maybe you, you've got some other uh, attribute that, that tells you it's interesting. You want to look at 429 instead of 400 on your status code, something like that. Uh, but on the flip side, it's going to cost more to run the compute that's going to do this tail sampling. You're going to need more memory to keep all of those spans in memory. Um, it's also got a, a greater engineering costs. Your, your data, the shape of your telemetry doesn't stay static, and so your configuration of the, the processor is going to have to change as your uh, telemetry shape changes. 
Uh, and there's also then potentially going to be a networking cost because you do have to export 100% of the spans out of the SDK and into the collector, whereas with head sampling, you can drop a whole lot of that before you even generate the data. Great, so keeping all of that in mind, I think really a good segue into the next topic is really highlighting you've sampled all of your data, you've, you've really chosen the data that really matters to you, but you do want to still keep some of your unsampled traces, right? So you want to make sure that you want to keep an audit of what you've really been pulling in, right, in terms of compliance, in terms of um, regional use cases as well, right? You really want to focus on also directing data to specific backends that you can also do with, again, open telemetry. At a broader level, you'll also see a lot of the focus being on um, being able to, since open telemetry, again, is vendor agnostic, you can configure your exporters and send the data to different destinations. But what's important to consider, and a lot of questions that also come up from end users have been, how can this be set up based on certain attributes, right? How can we really choose to really send data to different destinations uh, based on some of the attributes that I add on to, which may be custom attributes, right? So again, you can also route the data that's being collected based on the data type. This may be metrics. You can route your metrics to a single destination, the logs to the other as well, obviously, but you can also choose to do that based on the source of the telemetry uh, or, or the attributes itself. So taking a step back and thinking of cost as well, um, really routing any non-critical data, uh, you think of use cases and solutions like uh, S3, right, for example, really routing those to low-cost cloud storage solutions, keeping in mind that if you really are looking for troubleshooting or really real-time querying, that's not going to be possible, right? And at the same time, as I called out earlier, a key use case for unsampled traces, right? You want to really sample those traces, but at the same time, keep uh, the full picture in your back pocket in terms of really pushing that out to lower cost storage so that you're really not having higher processing costs. Um, the third, really coming down to any audit use cases that I called out earlier, some customers and end users want to make sure that data does not really leave or exit the existing region or specific area where their users are, right? You'll, you'll hear of compliance use cases like GDPR, for example, right? So that's where, again, you want to make sure you route the data that you're collecting to the right destination as you really find appropriate. And I think the last call out, I think, again, this probably, Anthony and I spoke a, a quite a lot about this, and this deserves probably a, a more detailed discussion on is um, high availability, right? High availability is such a, is such a key discussion and a key point that is brought up by a lot of customers and end users, uh, and really how disaster recovery can be better handled in terms of uh, where data is being sent out to your observability vendor can be configured with the collector, right? So you need not really necessarily double publish your data all the time, right, which can increase costs, or you might, you might also think of just like, modifying your exporter configuration, right, and making certain changes. But instead, with uh, the concept of the failover connector, for example, right? You can actually set up um, health-based routing, right? Really between all of your different pipelines and really send data to each of those exporting destinations based on the health of the destination itself, right? Again, you can actually do that based on priority as well. So I heavily recommend you to definitely check the failover connector out if key, like high availability is a common use case that comes up to you. Great. Okay, uh, next we'll talk a little bit about transformation of the data um, for various purposes. Um, one of the things you may wish to do there is to, to normalize your data. Uh, if you've got high cardinality attributes that you want to ensure the cardinality doesn't get out of hand, um, or maybe you've, you've got um, some information that you, you can't have go on to a, a third party vendor and needs to be removed. Uh, the transform processor um, utilizes OTTL, which was mentioned earlier when we were talking about filtering, um, for, for doing those sorts of things as well. Um, you, can, you can use it to convert to JSON attributes. Uh, if you've got a JSON certified value in an attribute, you can turn that into a set of attributes. Um, or uh, you can use it to, to cut out just parts of those attributes so that you don't have high cardinality parts of those attributes that go on to further processing. Um, and this is hugely valuable when you combine it with the span-to-metrics processor, which is another form of transformation, which is, in this case, turning 
traces or spans into usable metrics, uh, particularly easy to get the, the red metrics, rate, error, and duration, uh, out of your spans because all of the, that information is right there in your spans. Uh, but unfortunately, trace attributes are often high cardinality and you don't necessarily want that to flow into your metric system. Um, so if we look here, we'll see this is, uh, again, an example from the, the hotel demos collector's self-metrics where we've got uh, down here at our outgoing metric rate um, with the span to metrics processor, but no transformation added. There are a couple of high cardinality metrics that cause the number of metrics that we met to discontinue growing linearly over time, uh, which is not really a, a great uh, thing. So we can put in a couple of OTTL transform statements. Uh, in this case, we're in the span name, removing all query string attributes, uh, a, a question mark and anything after that. We say that that doesn't have value for us in, in metrics. Uh, similarly, we know we've got an API that has path parameters that, that might be high cardinality. So rather than keeping all of those individual product IDs, we can just replace it with a placeholder product ID, uh, knowing that the, the behavior of that endpoint is hopefully the same for all products. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we see over here very quickly, then the, the rate drops off and stays very flat after that point because we've eliminated some of those high cardinality attributes by transforming them into normalized low cardinality versions. Great, so I think all of the different use cases and best practices we spoke about, it all of it really comes together well when you speak about an end user story, right? So um, as you were, all of you, a lot of you would have been here um, as part of the end user panel where we had a lot of questions in terms of best practices in terms of how you can optimize cost and telemetry. And we're going to be speaking to one, and that's Skyscanner today. A huge shout out to uh, Daniel, who's here as well, for sharing and walking through this use case with both of us, right? And it was really useful. So uh, at a higher level, uh, really looking at the scale that Sky Skyscanner really operates at today, around close to 2.7 million spans per second and around 100 K traces per second, that's the amount of data that's really being sent in to the collector. Right, um, very effective strategies to start off. I think it starts off with really cost allocation being built back to service teams. They have their own budgets. And again, tracking becomes specifically easier because of the uh, standard resource attributes. So think of service name and service namespace, right? So that really makes it a lot more easier in terms of tracking. You're also really highlighting the fact that um, they're using transformation with some of the processors we spoke about earlier today. Uh, a lot, right, in terms of really they've adopted it at scale, right? So they're able to shape their envoy spans into HTTP metrics, and uh, they found a lot of value doing so. Uh, in terms of sampling at their scale, they're also doing tail sampling at around 4 to 5% of those traces. And I think as we spoke about, uh, right, it's important to evaluate whether certain telemetry types make sense to you or not. So that's exactly what uh, Skyscanner also evaluated, right? That logging was a big chunk of their costs. So that's where they were really seeing a lot of verbose logs being sent out in terms of debug logging. Really, they moved over to distributed tracing to get more value, and they were able to see tremendous uh, improvement in costs. I think it's important to quickly call out some challenges that were shared as well, that uh, in terms of tail sampling, I think since it is centrally managed, right, um, it does often limit uh, in terms of the service owners, right, that you can really look at and you can choose what you want to store eventually. And it also becomes harder to identify some costs, right? If there is a downstream error that has been uh, called out when you store the entire trace, because you are doing that right at the end for tail sampling. Right? Cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you so much. I think we want to quickly also call out, uh, we'd love to really have you stop by at, at the observatory if you really found any of this information or any more use cases you'd like to contribute to. Uh, feel free to come by, and we'd love to kind of hear more of uh, some of your scenarios. Yep. Or come to ContribFest Friday afternoon. That's a great way to get started with the project as well. Yeah, and you've heard a lot about OTTL. Uh, there's also a session on Wednesday uh, by Evan and, and Tyler as well, which is a great walkthrough of some of the recipes and configuration that you could leverage for OTTL. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.